Welcome to our Conversations podcast, where we discuss personal career, entrepreneur and business growth with guests who are an expert in their field. Today, we focus on personal growth, specifically mental health and wellness. There have been so many changes that have happened globally over the past year, and these changes have taken a toll on so many of us. We've had to adapt and readapt and take on more and learn to cope as best as we can. So now more than ever, it's important to discuss mental health and wellness and understand how we can cope with ever-changing circumstances that are impacting on our personal growth. On that note, we're honored to have Dr. Angela L. Harris join us as a guest to share her wisdom and insights on this very important topic. Dr. Harris, who's also known as Doc Sarah on social media, hails from North Carolina in the US. She's an expert in mental health and wellness and an active advocate for it. Through her work, she aims to highlight the intersections of mental health, faith, and spirituality. She has her doctorate in psychology and over 15 years of experience working in higher education. She spent four years as a full-time therapist in a high-paced counseling center at a public state university and is currently an assistant dean at a private liberal arts college. She's a daughter, sister, bestie, auntie, niece, and a friend. Welcome, Dr. Angela Harris. Hey, Diane. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so excited to chat with you today. Wonderful. Thanks, Angela. It's so great to have you here. And, you know, during our initial conversation, you gave such a great background to how you came into the field of mental health and wellness. Do you mind telling us and sharing with us a little bit about your journey and how you got involved there? Yeah, yeah. So you mentioned, Diane, uh, my over 15 years, over 20 years now of experience in higher education. And so what really kind of propelled me into mental health or the field of mental health and getting my doctorate degree in mental health, I was working at a college and I was working in student life where I really was supporting students and really promoting um, diversity and multiculturalism uh, through the responsibilities of my job. And with that, I would work with a lot of students of color, more specifically, a lot of African-American Black students who I developed friendships and relationships with in regards to just mentoring them from freshman year to senior year. And during those times, I had a lot of students who would often come to me about some of their concerns about just you know, whether that was family, whether that was interpersonal relationships, whether that was the reason why I'm not doing well is because I'm not feeling my best. And so a lot of times I would refer students to our counseling center or our counselors that we had on on campus. With this particular college, there was no counseling center per se. So we would contract our services out to clinicians in the community. And we contracted with two or three clinicians who happened to be white women. And the students were trusting that I was uh, referring them to people who can help them. But the question that always came up was, is there anyone that looks like you? Are there any black counselors? And I would always have to say no. And then students were hesitant to meet and then they would continue to just kind of share their issues with me. And so at that time, I knew I wanted to go back to school. I just was not sure. And I've always identified myself and others have identified and labeled me as a helper. And so at that time, um, I decided I wanted to go back to school because I wanted students to not have to have asked the question, is there a counselor that looks like me? So I decided to leave my full-time job and get my doctorate degree in clinical psychology. And so that really was kind of what propelled me into mental health. And so it really was important for students to be able to say, I have a plethora of of clinicians that I can choose from, and some of these counselors also look like me. There was still a low percentage of African-American clinicians, more specifically psychologists. So really, that's, that's the story. That's what propelled it. Me really thinking, I don't want any student to say, is there a Black counselor that I can talk to? Sounds like an amazing journey, Angela. And it sounds as though, especially from the student's perspective, and maybe on a broader basis, that people are starting to talk more openly about the issues surrounding mental health. So although people are talking about it more openly, there still seems to be quite a bit of confusion around mental health and mental illness and what exactly it is. Are you able to tell us what exactly mental health is on the one hand, and then what exactly mental illness is on the other hand? 
So a lot of times mental health for some people could mean mental illness or vice versa. Really, there is a difference, but subtly. So with mental illness, it really is looking at the conditions that affect people's thinking, behavior, and mood. So when there are conditions that alter that or block you from being successful at work or being a good parent, those things are considered mental illnesses. And there are actually you know, labels and definitions in regards to clinical depression, generalized anxiety, bipolar. Those are some of the common mental health challenges or mental illnesses that people know. Mental health is just really just that optimal level of being, right? So just like we think about oral hygiene, that's brushing your teeth and that's making sure you're flushing and that's making sure that you're going to the dentist. Well, mental health is the same. It really is being intentional on the way you are thinking, the way you are behaving, and the way you are really existing in the world. So making sure that your mood is intact, that you're feeling pretty much stable. You're feeling good. You're feeling happy. There's nothing in your life that's impeding you or being a barrier to you existing and and being successful. It's making sure that your mind is clear, that you are healthy in regards to wellness, and that you are behaving accordingly, right? And so when all those things are kind of at the optimal level, A+, plus. We consider that an overall good mental health. When we start to decline in those areas, um, such as not getting enough sleep and being irritable, or maybe your mind is in a fog and not clear, those are conditions or characteristics of maybe your mental health is compromised and that you may need to seek some support just to find out what else is going on. So that's the difference between mental health. And we look at it like oral health, hygiene, physical health those check markers of living an optimal life. And then when we're declining, we kind of see some of the mental illness or mental health disorders come to play. Yeah. So there's been so much stigma around mental illness for such a long time. Why is this the case? I still think it's that basic fear of the unknown. Like, why is someone behaving this way? Why is someone thinking this way? And so, again, when we're not sure of what's going on in the way a person is behaving, acting, thinking, it scares us. So when we really think about, like, where did the stigma come from? It really is, like, media and stories and people looking down on people who have mental health challenges. So if you have a family member or you know someone who's hearing voices and they're hallucinating and they can't keep a job and they're having all these issues with their mental health and maybe they've been diagnosed with schizophrenia, well, that's scary. It's just like that person is hearing voices and that that person can't get a job and they may harm me, right? Because we see how media and society kind of beefs it up in regards to people with mental illness or mental health disorders, they can't be trusted. So when we think about you know, people out on the street, people who may experience not only mental disorders, but also substance abuse. And so it's just a scary thing to see people who are not able to function. And so the stigma is those people are crazy. Those people will steal from you. Those people will hurt from you. And it really is not fair to the person who really is just struggling with maybe depression or generalized anxiety or some of the big ones such as schizophrenia or bipolar disorder. Everyday people struggle with mental health, right? And it could be different levels. I can really just, you know, have issues with depression, but there's someone else who has clinical depression, right? And they can't get out of bed and then we deem them as lazy. So the stigma is really just that it's something that we don't understand and we're just, it's easy to just say that that person is crazy. But I do feel that the shift is happening now and not saying that the stigma is totally erased, but just the fact that you and I are talking about mental health. There are more people talking about mental health than ever today. You have commercials that are talking about mental health and and medication that could help. You have social media and you have clinicians who are promoting their services and talking about how we all are responsible for decreasing the stigma to mental health. I think the shift is happening, but there's still so much more work to be done. So there are a lot of different people, individuals, organizations that are doing their part where one day we can wake up and say, no, that person is not crazy. Don't belittle them. They are just dealing with a chemical imbalance or environmental issue. And we shouldn't label them as bad or lazy or crazy just because we don't understand. 
Yeah, that's so true, Angela. And you, you mentioned some of the common myths in there that tend to come through around the topic of mental illness. When you've worked with individuals before, you've obviously heard their stories and had some really intense conversations with them. What are some of the truths and the individual experiences that people have in terms of mental illness? Mm -hmm. Really, you know, former patients, former clients that I would work with is that they really wanted to be better. Their truth is I'm not just waking up deciding I want to be depressed and I want to have my body full of anxiety so that I can't function in school and I can't work, you know, my full-time job. These were individuals who are really seeking what was wrong with them, how they can get better. And they were often feeling misunderstood by peers, by family members, by teachers, by employers. And so their truth really was, I know I'm not feeling myself. I've done therapy for one to two to three years, and I'm still not at my optimum level. So now I need to maybe consider medication. So their truths lie in, I want to feel better. I'm trying to do something, but it's also scary because you're telling me, you know, what do I say to this therapist? Is this medication going to do something? Some other truths are that some people, they really don't know where to turn. So some people are wanting to get mental health, but depending on their community, their cultural background, recognizing that it could be money, so they don't do anything. So it really is, I want to get help, but therapy and medication cost a lot of money. And so when we are hearing those type of stories or those type of narratives, it really is educating someone to say, there are clinicians who will see you for you know a sliding scale fee. And so really being able to, again, shut down that myth that, Yes, every service costs money, but just like every service, there's some people who are willing to work with you. I've never seen someone who's just like, no, I don't want you to help me. <laughs> I want to hold my anxiety for myself. I want to ho hold my clinical depression for myself, or I want to keep hearing voices. The truth is people want to feel better. They want to be able to function. They want to be able to go to their job and not feel like they're going to break down every single second, or they want to be understood by their kids, you know, to say like, mommy is sad today, but mommy will play with you tomorrow. So it's everyday people who want to get better so that they can thrive. And really it goes back to that stigma of us mislabeling them thinking that they don't want to get better. So those are some of the narratives that I experienced that I've heard firsthand. And that's where highly trained clinicians, licensed clinicians, mental health counselors, social workers, psychologists, psychiatrists, we all work together, nurses, we all collectively work together to really support individuals who are struggling and want to feel and be better. You mentioned thriving earlier, and often it can be quite difficult to thrive in extensive change or ongoing change. And we've seen mm -hmm. over the last year that the world has become such a different place and people have had to deal with unusual and very difficult circumstances. So in your experience, how have these recent changes, for example, this global pandemic that we've had, how has that affected mental health in general? Mm -hmm. Good question. And so there's a lot of emerging research that um, people are doing in regards to mental health and the global pandemic. And it really is going to be a good foundation as we learn how to operate, you know, if this happens again. In regards to the pandemic and mental health, it definitely has taken a toll on individuals. You know, if I'm going to be transparent, the, the pandemic has taken a toll on my own mental health. And so when we think about people who are thriving, you know, when I think about extroverts who love to be out with their friends and out in the world, and they're always with people and they get their energy from other people, and then you're told and mandated to stay at home. Well, think about it. What does that do to an extrovert, right? So a person who's used to being around people and getting that energy no longer has that. So that's going to play on their mental health. When we think about children and we think about teenagers and then their routine of getting up in the morning and brushing their teeth and having their eggs and yogurt and getting on the bus and being able to see their friends and then be able to walk down the hall and be with their classmates. And now you have a pandemic that takes all that away. What does that do to the mental health of a child? I can't see little Johnny. I can't see my favorite teacher. 
I can't eat lunch with my friends. We're used to all hanging out on the playground. And now these children and these teenagers are stuck at home. And so you might see some irritability. You might see some sadness. You might see some loneliness. If you're the only child and all your energy was coming from your little classmates and now you're at home. Yeah, that child may have um, difficulty sleeping or become a little bit uh, disobedient because they're, they're acting out because they were used to this routine and now that routine is taken away from them. When we think about adults, and we think about the, the people who are going to work every day and that routine of you know, driving and being in traffic and seeing your colleagues at the water cooler and having your staff meetings around the table where you were able to kind of shoot the breeze and then still get work done. And now some of these individuals have been sitting and working from home for a year that's going to take a toll on people's mental health, right? And again, when we think about the levels, it, could, it, it may be just misses being at work because they liked the, the family atmosphere being with their colleagues. But then for some people, that's going to be bumped up a little bit. So maybe a person is already experiencing depression or anxiety, and now the pandemic, it rises that to maybe clinical depression or generalized anxiety. People who are scared of germs, you know, germaphobes, or people who are now like, I'm so scared to be out in the world, they now are sitting at home more often because they're scared to touch things. And so you have agoraphobia that comes in in regards to the fear of leaving your house and being outside in the world. So a lot of people are impacted in different ways. Again, it could be really minimal or it could be severe and then could be in between. And so really it is us individuals doing their own mental health check. So an example of that could be, I'll use a real life example. I was feeling like the four walls were closing in on me because I'd been home in my own space for a couple of months now, almost a year. And I just needed a change of pace. I was feeling stuck in my own space. And so I said, what can I do? I'm feeling a little down. And I just said, I need to change the scenery. And so I just traveled and a staycation, but the next state over and, you know, was able to get a hotel and relax and different for our walls, but is what I needed to kind of um, get myself back to baseline of like, okay, I, this is a little vacation is what I need. A little getaway is what I need. So the pandemic definitely has impacted a lot of people. Some been okay. So we can't, we can't also assume that a pandemic is going to um, impact everyone's mental health. But at some point, um, things shift for people, and it could be small, or it could be severe. And so with the pandemic being one factor that has influenced and been a heavy weight, as far as our mental health is concerned, Angela, what are some of the other day to day factors that affect our mental health, some that we might not even be aware of? Mm-hmm. Everyday factors that can affect mental health, it can be really subtle, like, you know, a difficult exchange at work with a colleague that then you then ponder on later, or it still is in your spirit or in your mind, and you're like, why am I holding on to this? It could be just that interpersonal or intrinsic existential questions that may come up for people, um, depending on different age milestones that happen. Overall day-to-day of just work or school or finances or your interpersonal relationships, your marriage, your relationship with your friends. So depending on how those things are playing out, you could feel really good, but if there are some issues in any of those areas, it can make you lose sleep. It can make you um, not eat as much because you're worried. It could make you not exercise because you're feeling lethargic. So depending on just what's going on, if we have maybe some um, medical issues, right? So if you're going through menopause, that could play a part on your mental health. I could be driving to work and my car breaks down. That can play on my mental health, right? I'm going to be irritable. I'm going to be angry. And then if I don't have the money to pay for it, you know, then I'm going to, you know, really feel like, wow, you know, I need to do something more. I need to get a better job. Then you start saying like, I'm not worthy. And then you just really throw yourself in a rabbit hole all because your car broke down. 
And now you're second guessing, like, am I good enough? Why can't I get a promotion? Because you're looking at your finance. Um, if you are in a relationship, whether that's marriage or just ha having an intimate partner, maybe communication is off, or maybe your partner's not paying you enough attention, you can start to feel less than, not pretty, and you're not affirming yourself. So it could be everything, anything um, for some people. So just everyday things we need to be mindful of how we're like doing that self-reflection every day. Like, how am I feeling when I wake up in the morning? You know, how am I that mid afternoon check? You know, how am I feeling this afternoon? I'm having a really good day. Wow. I'm not, I'm feeling a little anxious. Why am I feeling anxious? And being able to ask yourself those questions, what's making me irritable right now. So it just depends on the individual and really the resilience and the coping strategies that each individual has. If we are able to understand our own mental health and what's the barrier of us being happy on any given day, we can then stop and say, what do I need to do to shift this and change this for myself? So if I'm feeling a little lethargic or irritable, maybe I need to look at my sleep. Maybe I'm not getting enough sleep or maybe I'm not hydrated. So that's why I'm feeling a little foggy. And these are kind of basic things. Of course, when we think about clinical disorders, you know, there's a lot more. But when we talk about just everyday optimum mental health, it really is asking yourself those questions. You know, how am I feeling? And a lot of times we go through each hour, each hour, not even saying, how am I feeling today? Making mental note of like, what are our thoughts? How are we feeling? What are we sensing? That information can tell us a lot about our mental health if we take time to ask ourselves those questions. There are so many scenarios that can affect and so many factors that can affect our mental health. What are some of the obvious signs that tell us that we need to take better care of our mental health? Yes. So I say that when people are really able to reflect and ask themselves, these are some common themes. So when people are feeling a sense of sadness or a void, now for different mental health disorders or challenges, there are time frames. Like if I just if I'm just sad today, it doesn't mean that I have clinical depression. But if I'm sad for a period of time, typically two weeks, and there are other symptoms that go with clinical depression, then I could be diagnosed with clinical depression. But some overall signs that maybe your mental health is compromised, sleep, so sleeping too much or too little, eating too much or too little, having that overall sense of sadness, you know, maybe you're crying and you're not sure why you're crying, that void and that emptiness, you know, maybe you have a bunch of friends and family and everyone loves you, but you're still feeling unloved. When you're feeling a sense of overall worry, so your mind is constantly racing with things that are out of your control, or maybe, you know, if we added more in regards to clinical things that are happening, you know, maybe you're feeling a sense of disconnect from society. So you're starting to feel outside of yourself. Maybe your, your brain or your mind seems like it's in a fog. Um, so those are some like basic common things that can tell you, maybe you can benefit from talking to someone. A lot of times people will run to their primary healthcare doctor, which is fine, because depending on the assessment that they will do with you, they might see or deem it as more psychological and then may refer you to a mental health professional. Because a lot of times people, they're like, something is off and they're not necessarily thinking that it's their mental health. It could be physical. So sometimes you're just feeling like your body is aching or you're like, my jaws hurt because you've been grinding your teeth all night because you're worrying. So there's just a lot of different things, but I think some of the common ones sleeping too much or too little, eating too much or too little, irritability, sadness, maybe your interpersonal relationships are starting to feel less fulfilling and you're disconnecting or feeling isolated. So those are some common ones that people will pick up first on that, like saying something is off. I'm sure many people are in the boat where they want to make 2021 a better year for themselves. Mm -hmm. What is it that we can all do on a daily, on a weekly, or on a monthly basis that can help us to take better care of our mental health? 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So again, really thinking about mental health being that overall working at an optimum level regarding your behavior, your thinking, your mood. And so if we can really target those areas in regards to doing something intentional to make ourselves feel good in those areas, we can definitely have optimum mental health. So it really is overall self-care, you know, that kind of the buzzword, but really just making sure that you're reflecting and taking care of you. So doing things that are going to put positive thoughts in your mind, really being reflective and affirming yourself, being able to, again, bring that wellness piece in, in regards to overall physical wellness, which helps mental health So being able to get 30 minutes or more of exercise in, making sure that you're keeping yourself hydrated, making sure that you're eating fruits and vegetables and putting good things in your body, because if your body feels good, then hopefully your mind will feel good. Being able to have really good relationships with others. And a lot of times people are like, how is that going to help my mental health? Well, if you are around people who are positive, who are affirming you, who are encouraging you, who love you, who care about you, then you feel good. And when you feel good, again, it's like the lights go off in your head. And so it really is thinking the people that are around me, the people that I invite in my life, the people that I'm inviting to sit at my table and join me are those positive people. And we all know that we have maybe one or two who we need to assess and say, this person is not good for me. They don't bring me joy. They're pretty toxic. And so being able to remove that out of your life. Some other things that we can do is be informed, right? And so if you are sensing that something is off, the way you can be informed about what is going on with you, your mind, body, and spirit is to be able to talk to your doctor or seek mental health So when we're not feeling our best, be able to say something and do something. But just overall self-care, getting more sleep, eating right, affirming yourself, whether that's through music, whether that's through reading, whether that's through post-it notes, those are the things that we can do to make sure that our mental health is at an A+. We can decline, but there's always opportunity to get back up. But those everyday things matter because if we can do those things every single day, such as encouraging ourselves and getting enough sleep and eating and exercise, those are things that have been drilled in us. You can go on Google and say, you know, find out what are the things I can do to improve my overall mental health. And some of these things that I just talked about will be there. If we can engage in those things, we have a better chance of remaining stable Life crises will shatter us. Um, I don't want to minimize that. But but if we're able to do those things every day to take care of our mental health, we can somewhat bounce back. You know, you've given us so much to think about today in terms of taking care of our mental health and actually how to deal with situations and how to deal with mental illness should it get to that point. Do you have any final advice or words that you'd like to leave with our listeners regarding mental health and wellness? Mm-hmm. Well, one, I'm so excited again, just to be here talking to you. And this topic is one that I'm really passionate about. So being able to support other people who struggle with mental health is kind of the, the thing I want to hit home because we have people, our friends, our family members, we have people all around us who may be struggling with their mental health. And sometimes those individuals are not always able to let us know what they need, right? So they might uh, cancel things all the time because they have anxiety, or they may want to hang out with you and talk on the phone, but they missed your text message because they're sleeping because that's all they want to do is sleep. So really those type of experiences can really, we can take it personal We can say like, why aren't they calling me back? And why don't they want to hang out? And oh my God, you know, there's always something going on. And it really is, we need to understand that when people are struggling with their mental health, they are not their best versions of themselves because they're in a period in which, you know, the depression is hit hard, the anxiety is hit hard. So if I can understand that, I can offer a little bit more grace and a little bit more compassion, right? It's not always easy for someone to say, you know, I didn't go out with you because I had a panic attack or I didn't respond to that text message. I know you've been reaching out to talk to me and to hang out and to see me, but I've really been dealing with my depression and I'm trying to get my medication right. Like there's a narrative, there's a story behind that. And that's not always easy for people to express 
or communicate and not that they have to all the time, right? So there can be just an understanding, being more empathetic, showing more compassion for um, those loved ones that we know who are important to us, who struggle with mental health, that we can just meet them halfway um, and be a little bit more understanding and not judgmental. That would be the note I want to I wanna leave with your listeners today. You've shared so many great insights with us. As I said, you've given us all so much valuable information about mental health, mental illness, and taking care of our mental state. And um, if people want to get in touch with you and have a conversation around mental health and wellness and connect with you, where can they reach you? Well, if anyone is interested in connecting with me, you can email me directly um, at drangelalharris at gmail.com. People can find us on Instagram at Harris 316 Consulting and Services. Our website, that's drangelalharris.com. And you can find more information there. But those will be the, the three ways, Instagram, our email, and our website. Yep. And I want to say that Instagram one more time, Harris 316 Consulting and Services. Awesome, Angela. And you mentioned that you do workshops. Do you do workshops online in case anybody else across the globe is interested in chatting with you? Yes, yes. And so a lot of my um, services are now virtual now. If anyone is interested in me doing a workshop for them about mental health and self-care, I've done suicide prevention, I've done domestic violence workshops. And so I would love to, to connect with any of your listeners who are interested Wonderful. Thanks again so much, Angela. And uh, yeah, hoping to chat to you in a future podcast again. Okay. Thank you, Diane. It's been a pleasure. And thank you so much for having me. We hope that you enjoyed today's podcast episode. Be sure to come back regularly for more great content that focuses on personal, career, entrepreneur, and business growth. Find out more about our coaching services and get in touch with our team by following the link in our post or visit dingscoconsulting.co.za.